Hello and welcome to the latest talk. Uh, this is a seven minute scenario as opposed to a 10 minute topic. I'm going to talk about massive hematemesis. My name's Dan Halperin. So what's this all about? Um, this is going to be a part of a series of around seven minutes looking at the acute management of unwell patients. So as opposed to the 10 minute topics, which are overviews of one particular area, these are focused more about situational thinking, step-by-step um, -step, uh, reactions, and looking at acute presentations. The talks are designed for all grades, and it's the aim really is to help structure your thinking and decision-making in the heat of the moment. To get the most out of this, uh, try and immerse yourself as much as possible. Really try and imagine you're in the moment and how you would actually react and manage and you'll hopefully get something out of it. Okay. So let's set the scene. It's a dark and stormy night on the wards. Imagine it's 3 a.m. The nurses on an outlier ward give you a ring. The nurse sounds pretty panicked, asks you to attend quickly as the patient is bleeding out. Not the words you want to hear at 3 a.m. You're in charge of your team for this case, so the decision making is going to be up to you. And try and picture this in your mind. So you're going to get your phone handover. So, hi doc, can you get here quickly? I've got a guy who started throwing up fresh blood a couple of minutes ago. Looks like about half a litre, but he is still vomiting. He's 67 years old. He's coming with unstaged angina a couple of days ago. I think he might have liver trouble because of his weight and diabetes, but I don't really know what it's called. Otherwise, he's been fine. He's meant to go home tomorrow, actually. Right, stop there and think about what else you want to know on the phone. And think S-bar. If you haven't heard of Vespa, we'll go through it. So the things I'd want to know for her to reply to are what are the obs? That's a fairly obvious one. So this chap's afebrile, he's breathing at 25 um, breaths per minute, heart rate's a bit high, 130, blood pressure 90 over 62. I'd want to know what his GCS is. Luckily, so far it's 15. And I'd want to know what the team there have done already so they've given him a little bit of saline okay so what's happened with Espo? she's told you the situation and the background you want to know what the assessment is i.e the obs gcs and things like that and the response which is the fluids and calling you and they've called you first because the crash team are attending an arrest on the ward next door how unfortunate for you so let's set the scene a bit more this is a dark corridor to the ward I couldn't find a bed with a patient in, um, so uh, here's an empty bed. Imagine the patient's next door. Okay, so scene is set. So on arrival, blood is around the patient's mouth. It's down the front of his gown and in the bowl next to him. It's bright red. He's got the empty bag of 250 saline attached to a pink cannula in his left hand. He's got a litre of oxygen going in via nasal specs. He is talking to the nurses in between retching in short sentences and the sat's fine, 97%. Blood pressure taken whilst you were en route shows a, a tiny drop, 86 over 60. So think about your approach. Okay, we've all learned ABCDE, so I want you to think about how you're going to do it based on what you've got up above. And you're at the end of the bed. And to me, the most important assessment you do is the end of the bedogram. That one look that subconsciously will tell you how sick is this patient? How worried am I right now? Okay, so initial management. So airway, you know his airway's fine because he's talking. Breathing's fine, he's 97% on one litre. If you want to have a quick listen to his chest, go ahead. He's in no obvious respiratory distress. Cardiovascular is where you're likely to see some problems here. Low BP, high heart rate. So we need to be thinking about things like access, big cannula, Fluids, bloods you want to take first, group and save, um, clotting, all the rest of it, the usual. What size cannula do you, do you want? Think about that, uh, see what the ward has. What kind of fluids are you going to use? You send up a VBG, order a blood transfusion. These are all things that should be going through your mind at this point. Looking at disability, his GCS, we know it's 15. Just double check that when you get there. No obvious neurological impairment, and you're going to ask for a glucose measurement, which is fine. And then everything else, really important in these patients, don't miss 
the melina in the patient. Okay, so this patient doesn't have it, but anyone who is throwing up blood, you must do the check. Have a feel of his abdomen, and he's got pretty severe epigastric pain. And you're going to look for any of obvious injuries, um, bruises on his head, all signs of liver failure in this situation, anything else that kind of might leap out at you. And whilst you're doing all this, looking at these things, getting access and so on, you can be taking your history at the same time. So let's get a little bit of history. There was a sudden onset of pain two or three hours ago. This is severe burning pain, epigastric, followed by vomiting. At first, this was just a bit of bloodstained vomiting, followed by frank hematemesis. The patients never had this before. Originally, they were admitted with unstable angina and treated medically for an NSTEMI. So they were given medical treatment, aspirin, ticagrelor, and low molecular weight heparin. The patient's medical history is of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and reflux disease. So take a minute and decide what you think is going on here as the most likely diagnosis. What information would you like to know? This is the other thing. And then finally, do you need a gastroenterologist at this point? And what about a surgeon? Okay, so I think this is most likely going to be ulcer related, uh, gastric or duodenal ulcer. The information I'd want to know is, has he had any of this type of pain before? He's been having increasing pain after or in between meals and any blood stain, vomiting or melina or anything that could suggest that. The reason I've included this mention about the gastroenterologists is that it's quite common to call a gastroenterologist as soon as one of these patients presents. And really at this point, they're not going to do that much. You want to stabilize and resuscitate the patient first and think about what's going on to decide if the gastroenterologist is the right person to call. If you think this is an ulcer, this may well be more likely to be a surgical issue. And again, you need to think about whether this is the right time to call them. Okay, so you got your VBG, you decided to get one, good choice. These numbers all look, they all look okay, except for the hemoglobin is pretty low at 69. Not surprising, however. Lactate's up a little bit, and again, that suggests acute loss. Everything else looks so far okay. Right, suddenly, at that moment, the patient starts vomiting massive amounts of blood. Heart rate on the SATS machine goes up to 140, and he starts looking really pale. So this is a massive hematemesis at this point. What are you going to do? Just take a second to get your thoughts together and think about the first step in this case. Call it, 2222. Two, two, two. Unfortunately, this other arrest is still happening, but you've been given some staff now. You're given a doctor and a dart nurse. They're sent over to you, but you're in charge. Okay, so on this slide, we have your team. There's uh, you on the left in the cape though. At least that's how you may uh, perceive yourself. Next to you, there's a junior doctor, a dart nurse, a ward nurse, and an HCA. Each of these people can do something simultaneously. And you're gonna be thinking about what tasks need to be done at this point and who's best to do what. So perhaps make a little list now before we move on to the next slide and think, start thinking about who you want to do those different tasks at this point in time. Okay, so you've got your team, you've got you, a medical colleague, a dart nurse, a ward nurse, and an HCA. I've got here a list of possible actions. I want you to think about which team member is most suited to do which of these tasks. Think about who's got the best skill set and how to evenly spread the list of tasks around. Whilst you're doing that, I just want to point out that IV PPI is a no-go and that's because in an emergency situation it is not proven to work. There's some evidence that it may even have adverse effects. The other thing I will say is calling a gastroenterologist is unlikely to be useful here as they will want the patient properly resuscitated first, especially in this fairly horrendous situation. So pause the slide now and just have a think about who's going to do what. Okay, so you've instigated your steps and the patient has stopped vomiting. So a bit of a 
bit of a breather. Your repeat gas shows a hemoglobin of 40, just as your porters bring blood pack 1. Blood pack 1 is 4 units of red cells. FFP is not part of this pack. You need to be very, very aware of what's in the different packs. So I definitely advise reading the protocols. And so you need to check clotting and platelets if you're considering giving them any of these. They will not come automatically as part of the pack. So you need to know what your numbers are and consider what you want to request. Luckily, the crash team has, uh, has rocked up. Next door's event finished and the team arrive. The cavalry is here. The patient stabilizes, mainly with the management you've already instigated, so well done. And your ITU colleagues have accepted the patient. So the question here is to CT or not CT. So you need to decide whether you think the patient has perforated. Given the presentation, I think this chat probably has. And you also want to think about whether they are stable enough to go into the scanner. Do you have the staff or are the staff available or qualified to accompany them and keep them safe? And you also need to know that the result is something that you can action. Let's say you had a very, very elderly patient with multiple comorbidities that was not going to be fit for surgery. Would a CT necessarily be the best thing to do? Something you'd at least want to discuss with your colleagues or seniors. If the patient has perforated on CT for this patient, you're going to want to contact the surgeons and Think about getting them prepped for surgery. If not, you want to continue resuscitating. So the best person to look after this patient, if they haven't perforated, will be ITU if they accept the patient. And then you need a discussion between seniors on ITU or ACB, if that's a decision made, and gastro. And that will be to decide whether an emergency attempt at endoscopy is going to be fruitful, or whether you should do other scans like CT angiograms or simply continue to stabilize and resuscitate. Okay, so we sent them for a scan. We've seen a perforation. The pictures here show some free air around the liver uh, in the uh, biliary areas as well. And just note that you could also, you know, if they weren't fit for CT, you could or this, you know, there was a long wait for the scanner, you could consider an upright x-ray just to see if there was air under the diaphragm. Not definitive, but perhaps helpful. So the decision was made to stabilize the patient in ITU before the scan. The result was reviewed by the surgeons. The patient went to theater for a surgical repair. Job done. The last thing is just a quick note on varices. Okay, so when you look in the hospital protocols, which I um, advise you do, you'll notice that varices are treated very differently. So varices are often a chronic problem. They don't tend to cause pain in the same way as, say, an ulcer. You use different medications, um, most notably is the use of terlipressin. And they can have chronically low blood pressure. So our initial blood pressure, which was 80, 90-ish, might be very low in someone who's got an ulcer or is um, normally on antihypertensives, but in a chronic liver disease with varices, this may well be their baseline. With these patients, you may well need to wait the gastro consultant, especially in this situation, and that's so they can come in and put in something called a Sengstake and Blakemore tube. There's a diagram of that on the bottom. It's essentially a balloon which redistributes the pressure and hopefully stops the bleeding. Okay, and that I definitely advise just reading a bit more about varices if you can. So our suggested next steps for this, if you haven't heard of SBAR before, please go look it up. It's very useful. It's trust guidelines and upper GI bleeding, including the varices and the major hemorrhage protocols. Thank you for listening.